to the live Q&A on Joyrider TV, where I'm going to be answering your catamaran sailing questions. If you've got any questions and you're not here for the live Q&A, then put them in the comments below and I'll respond to your questions in next week's live Q&A as a preloaded. Now, one of the hot topics that has been going on this week has been about the comp tip mast on certain types of Hobie Cat. Um, so firstly, what is a comp tip mast? Now, you'll find on most sailing boats around the world, the mast is made just of aluminium, nothing else, just an aluminium section, very straightforward. Um, but on certain types of Hobie, and this is just as far as I know, in the USA, the top part of the mast, just above where the rigging attaches, as indicated on the diagram here, is made of a fiberglass composite. And the reason for this is so that if the mast comes into contact with an overhead power line, then um, it's not going to conduct the electricity down through the mast. So the effects of striking that power line are not going to be quite as significant as if you had an aluminium mast, where if you hit an overhead power line with an aluminium mast, then it could be a really, really bad day. Um, so within the Hobie classes, um, there are certain boats which have never had the comp tip mast, like the Tiger, the Wildcat, the Fox, the FX1 and the Dragoon. So they've never had the comp tip mast. So what is the difference with the comp tip mast? Well, the it's mainly these days, if you're going to be racing, there are certain classes where you have to use a comp tip mast. So if you're racing in North America on the Hobie 14, the Hobie 16 or the Hobie 18, you have to use a comp tip mast. Now, um, I've been in touch with Rich from the Cross Association on this topic. And he said, if you're new to racing in the class, then that um, all of the classes are very keen to have as many people taking part as possible. So if you turn up at like the H Hobie 16 event in North America with an aluminium mast, they're not going to say, no, sorry, you can't take part. Um, but generally, the class rules say you need to be using a comp tip mast. The reason for this is because of the regulations in the USA. There we go. Um, then in if you're racing in Europe, um, you have to be using or anywhere else in the world. As far as I know, you have to be using an aluminium mast and not the comp tip. Um, the comp tip may come with slightly different bend characteristics, which means when you pull the downhaul on, maybe with the comp tip mast, the top section will bend more, giving you a flatter sail. Um, but other than that, the performance shouldn't be too much there. So there we go. Sort of defies the rule is the Hobie 17, where in Europe, and I'm not sure about Australia, but in Europe, the Hobie 17 was made with a, a regular aluminium mast, whereas in the USA, it is uh, with a comp tip mast. And with the Hobie 17 class, you can race with either section. Hmm. That's nice if you've got Hobie 17. So there you go. That's comp tip masts, I think, wrapped up for now, if we may. I'm sure the comment's going to say otherwise. But hello to everybody in the live chat. A TV channel member um, coming in from Maui, Hawaii. Only going to be here for a minute today, headed to work. But hey, it's the weekend and the Q&A is back. All right. Nice to have you with us, Ryan, if you are still with us. We've got 
from Zero Germany. Great to have you with us. Mark is on board, another Joyrider channel member. Uh, hello from Northern Ontario, Canada. Great to have you with us. From Zero to Foil, I believe, with a question. I will replace my boom fitting at the weekend. The old one ripped out partially. Any advice on how to proceed? I think I got it all. Maybe you have some pro tips. Oh, it's a carbon mast. Woo. All right. So if the fitting on your carbon mast for the boom has ripped, I think it is likely that it's going to have left a bit of a mess. Like the holes where if it was riveted into the mast before are going to be quite uh, enlarged, perhaps even a bit nasty looking. So if I had a fitting pull out of my carbon mast, I would definitely be inclined to fill those holes first. And I, if you've got the facility to do so, what I would fill, um, what is it called? Uh, like um, the word has escaped me. What are these? Micro bubbles. The very tight, it's like a thickening powder that you put into the epoxy to thicken it up. And then, so get the amount of micro bubbles in correctly. So mix the epoxy first, then add like a teaspoon at a time, micro bubbles, one teaspoon, give it a stir, check the consistency. And what you're looking for is a mayonnaise-like consistency in that paste. Um, it just thickens up the epoxy. Um, and then once you've got that mayonnaise-like hold of some, take a bit of carbon fiber mat and with some scissors or something, chop it up into fairly fine pieces, just small pieces, stir that in. And then when that's all stirred up nicely, put it into the holes in the mast to bring the mast back to as it was before that fitting was even there. And then once that's dried, drill some new holes, put the fitting back in and you should be good to go. But um, if the holes are not too much of a mess, then of course you could just uh, rivet or bolt the fitting back into the mast. But I think if something has ripped out of the mast, there is a strong chance that it's going to be a bit of a mess, I think. All right. We have got Philip on board. Great to have you with us, Philip. Thanks for tuning in. Um, all right, we got Max on board in Rosenheim, Germany. Great to have you with us, Max, as well. Mark is with us on vacation in Navarra, Navari, Navarre, Florida, taking a break from Ohio. Yeah, I bet um, the temperature is significantly different down in Florida. All right, and I've got a question coming in from Duncan, who says... Do the newer Tornado sails also fit on the Tornado aluminium mast? Uh, short answer is yes. Now, what you may have to do, which you probably will have to do, is to change the angle of the spreaders on the mast. So uh, basically, if you don't know, this is for others who are watching who may not know this. But on a mast, like on a Tornado, on an F-18 or other similar boats, you've got, rather than the mast just being as it is, about, I don't know, a third of the way up the mast, you've got these pieces that stick out like this, which are called spreaders. Onto the spreaders, there are wires attached that make a kite shape or a diamond shape, these are called the diamond wires, and using the diamond wires and the spreaders, we can actually pre-bend the mast. So just drawing it from the side, 
that would be the spreader it comes see the spreader comes back slightly the wire would come onto the end of the spreader then down to the bottom of the mast and then if we were to look from the top as well there's the mast there's the spreaders um, and what happens is this part of the mast is pushed forwards um, and by pushing that part of the mast forwards what that does is it puts a curve into the mast before we've even put the sails up now different sails are going to require different amounts of curve in the mast so the more modern sails are likely to want more curve in the mast whereas the older sails like from a a classic tornado are likely to have made been made for a straighter mast so to make the pre-bend on the mast greater what we will do is these spreaders that we have on the mast they come with some adjustment so what we can do is either lengthen the front arms or shorten the back arms depending on the system that you've got and as we bring those further back, it pushes the mast forwards more, putting more bend into the mast. So there's a good chance that with a modern tornado sail on a mast that you've been using only with a classic sail, you will need more pre-bend. So put the spreaders back a bit more. And then the diamond wires, the tension should be about the same regardless of your sail so as well as altering the uh the angle of the spreaders we can change the tension in the diamond wires um yeah so just to get a little bit more technical perhaps um the way we measure how much spreader rake or deflection that we have is from the wires just above the spreaders, we'll put a straight line like a, a baton is very good. And then with that baton running across there, we measure the distance between the baton and the trailing edge of the mast. And what we're looking for is about, um, sorry, it, it would be about six centimeters. That is what we would be looking for. Um, yeah, so if it's less than six centimeters, just means you need to bring the spreaders back a little bit more. And then with the diamond wires, generally speaking, we want to have those on the loose gauge um, at about 38. Um, I won't go into this too much at this time so there we go but yes you can put a modern tornado mainsail on an older tornado there we go all right so adam says i'm wondering if or why the comp tip prevents reefing the main on a 16 To be honest, I um I didn't know that the comp tip the comp tip did prevent reefing the mainsail on a Hobie 16. Um, because to reef the mainsail on a Hobie 16, the um the thing that we need is on the main halyard. So if this is the top of the mast. where the main halyard runs over, we've got our little fork here, which locks the halyard. Um, we would have two locks on the halyard. So as we pull the mainsail up, here's the mainsail, top of the mainsail. Um, there's the wire. And then to reef the mainsail, what we're looking for is a second lock there. And then the first 
lock will have uh will be like here if we're just rigging the boat normally so i i really don't know um if that's a thing that you can't reef for comp tip but i'd be surprised i think if you can't reef for comp tip it's probably your main halyard which is lacking and not the actual mast um which is preventing you from doing so i would imagine but sorry i've i haven't actually ever seen a comp tip mast in the flesh so i can't actually give you any more than that i'm afraid adam at this point all right we've got owen on board who says would you recommend replacing the shrouds and forestay with dyneema rope um it is becoming more popular these days to use dyneema rope uh instead of steel wire for um the shrouds and the forestay on the boat i would only use the dyneema for the in fact, if you're sailing a boat which um, doesn't have such a tight rig like a Hobie 16 or perhaps a Dar 18, Prindle 16, something like that, then I would personally, I would feel better about things sticking to the regular steel rope, steel wire. But if you're sailing a boat where the rig is under tension, all of the time while you're sailing and quite a high tension, then yes, by all means, uh, Dyneema rigging does seem to be a very popular choice of um, of rigging there these days, getting more popular all of the time. Because apparently for the diameter of the rope or wire, the Dyneema is actually stronger than the wire uh, if it is of the right type. Uh, now, the downside, I would say, of the Dyneema rope is that if it's under tension and you come into contact with you, it is going to be much sharper because of the narrower diameter than the steel wire. So that is something to bear in mind. But on the other hand, with the Dyneema rope, you're going to get much more of a clue before it fails rather than the steel cable, which isn't really going to give you any clues at all. And uh, one day you might just be out sailing and your shroud breaks, mast comes down, no warning at all. Um, so those, I would say, are the main considerations if you're looking at changing your standing rigging to Dyneema rather than the traditional steel cable. But yes, it is certainly a possibility. There we go. That's what I think. All right, we've got Matthew on board in Baltimore. He says, unseasonably warm in eastern USA now. Not enough winter sail today. But more boat maintenance on the cards. Very good. It's always, there's always something to do on the boat, whichever type of boat you've got. There's always more. OK. All right. Adam, incidentally, is in Wisconsin, USA. We've got Mr. Tony KP in Ebeltoft, Denmark. Great to have you on board there, Mr. Tony KP. Uh, Philip says poor sound quality and picture. Um, yeah, there's not a huge amount I can do about that at this time. Unfortunately, I'm just um, using once again the Greek uh, clock, clockwork internet. Um, I'm winding the handle as much as I can to keep the internet going. So hopefully, uh, at least what I'm saying is coming through with some sort of um, ability to understand it. All right, we've got Jeroen on board in Norway. Sound, sound is great. Okay, we're going for, uh, the other way. All right, Philip says, thanks for tuning in, Jeroen. Uh, I'm traveling to Dublin tomorrow to pick up a kit to make a cat tracks, then to Hobie Center, pick up new bits. It's going to be an expensive day. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, yeah, because the um, the cat tracks launching trolley for catamarans is very expensive. 
So if you're looking at buying some beach wheels or a launching trolley for your boat, uh, then if you want to get the one with the big wheels, uh, I have to say, if you're going to buy one from Hobie Cat, you're probably looking at, uh, I don't know, these days, 750 euros, which is probably even more US dollars. They are expensive. But on the other hand, they will last you for longer than your boat, as long as you look after it and don't uh, let people do the weightlifter and drop them on the floor too often. Uh, they're very sturdy, but very expensive. They probably cost about half as much as a road trailer. So good luck with that, Philip. And I hope it doesn't sting too much. All right. So Jeroen says, what is the approximate distance between the boom and the trampoline on a Hobie 16? All right. So uh, this is this is quite a tough one, actually, to do off the top of my head without any reference. I've got a tape measure here. So the distance. If we've got. Here's the mast. Front beam. Trampoline. And here is the boom. There's our main sheet there. All right. So I would say this is this is a pretty loose guess on the tape measure with no downhaul on. What are we thinking? Um, if anybody happens to be in the boat park right now next to a Hobie 16 with a tape measure, get your tape measure out and let us know in the live chat. Or in the comments below, of course, if you're watching later, I would say, yeah, at the boom end, something like about 55. That is without any um, downhaul on. Once you pull the downhaul on, that's going to get a bit smaller. And then at the other end of the trampoline, probably... Again, depends on a few things. One thing it's going to depend on is how much mast rake are you sailing with? If you're sailing with more mast rake, that's going to make the boom much lower. Um, or if you've let your rig tension off because it's windy, again, that's going to make your mast much lower. Oh, Matthew says, what measurement? I'm at my boat now. Okay, yeah, Matthew, the um, measurement between the boom and the trampoline um, at the mast, and then the boom and the trampoline at the back there um, next to the blocks, but without any tension on it. I should think at the back, the distance would be about the same. So stay tuned, Jeroen, because Matthew is doing some measuring even as you speak. This is interactive um, viewing. Very exciting. So there we go. All right, Duncan says, appreciate it. Thanks very much, Duncan. Yeah, I hope that was helpful. Gaz Gaz is on board. He's loving the show. Great to have you with us, Gaz Gaz. Uh, Max in Rosenheim, Germany says, why not hit the like button? Yeah, if you've got, this is my new thing right now. If you've got a spare finger, then uh, please do hit the like button because what that does is it means that this will be put in front of more people later on there's somebody thank you very much whoever that was um will put be put in front of more people so more people get to know this great information all right matthew says should we um Jeroen is in um norway so i think that's metric but either way it's 21 inches 53 centimeters at the front well i'd say my guess was pretty good there I said 53 centimetres out. I think we'll drink to that. Very good. Thank you very much for that, Matthew. Um, all right. I think it's time to go on to my first preloaded question for the session today. Uh, and hold on. This is from, this is from James. Um, 
who I think this question was on Patreon. And uh, James says he's just watching the beginner lessons just to refresh before heading out this season. And uh, he just wants to know about how do you set the jib for downwind sailing? All right, this is a great question. It is something that we don't really focus on too heavily. So firstly, before we can look at what we're doing with the jib, we need to look at what we're doing with the boat. So if this is the wind, when we're sailing downwind, we're going to be at approximately 45 degrees from straight downwind. Uh, obviously, this will be on either side depending on which way we're going. So if we did want to change direction from here to here, we would jibe. Um, so that is where the jibe comes in. The way we determine what angle we're going to sail at downwind, first of all, is you should always have fitted to the front of your catamaran some sort of wind indicator. So uh, this could be either... If this is a close up of our bridle wires, the wires that go from the forestay to the bows of the boat, um, you might have a um, some like a burgee that flies underneath here, or um, another one would be like a small like wind vane type thing which is basically like an arrow that points to where the wind is coming from. But, um, you know, these are quite uh, expensive parts to get for your boat. Um, what we use here is basically bits of old videotape, VHS. We used to use cassette tape, but videotape's better because it's thicker, which makes it easier to see. I'd generally... Uh, cut my videotape to a length of, now I know I've got a tape measure, I'm going to use it. Yeah, so that when it's tied on, it's about 20 centimetres or eight inches. Um, and I would tie that on about halfway along the bridle wires on both sides. Um, and these wind indicators are absolutely essential for when we're sailing the boat downwind. Um, so when we're sailing downwind, what angle do we want to have the wind indicators at? Well, what we're doing here is we're using what is called the apparent wind. So we're not actually looking at this wind that is blowing like if there was a flag on land. This wind would that flag would be in the direction of this wind which we'd call the true wind. That's the wind that is actually blowing. But we're not only using that because the boat is going forwards. So we're creating what is called the induced wind because we're inducing that wind by going forwards. So that induced wind is going to be hitting the boat straight on the nose. So the wind that we're actually using for sailing, the apparent wind, is a combination of the true wind and the induced wind. And what we're looking for on the downwind point of sail is for that apparent wind to be coming to us side on like this. Which means that what we're looking for with our wind indicators is for them to be flying straight across the boat at 90 degrees to the direct uh, to the boat. So straight across. Um, if they're flying too far forwards, it means we've gone too far down. So we need to come up a little bit. If they're flying too far backwards, uh, so we'll be going up here too much. So we need to come downwind a bit more just to get those in the sweet spot on that 90 degrees there. Okay, so that is our direction that we're going to sail at. 
So with the jib, what do we do? Well, uh, in basic terms, what we're trying to do is line the front of the jib up. If we have a, um, let's scale up here a little bit. OK, so what we want to do is line the front of the jib up with the way that the wind is blowing. So, for example, if we didn't have any telltales on the jib, this would be the way of getting it roughly in the right position. So we want the front of the jib like this. So the wind, the apparent wind, which is blowing this way, it's going to hit the jib. And then the way that the sails work on a catamaran is to get an even flow of air over both sides of the sail, not just on the inside. And that is the reason why we don't sail straight downwind, because that stops us from getting the wind on the outside of the sail. So it becomes very slow. So here we're getting this good flow on both sides of the sail and then that airflow will continue round the sail like that. And that is the most efficient spot to have it in. Now on our jib, we should have uh, telltales. So um, if this is the sail, maybe you're lucky enough to have little windows where you can see the telltales. The telltales are basically little bits of wool or tape, which um, they tell us what the airflow is doing around the jib. So we'll have one telltale on the back side of the, the side of the sail we can see through the sail. So that one I'm going to draw in red. That's through the sail. And then there'll be the telltale that we can see on th this side. And what we're aiming for is to have both of these telltales flying straight back because that indicates that we've got this even flow of air over both sides of the sail. Now, if it's if we don't have that even flow of air over both sides of the sail. So, for example, if the jib was in too tight. And we weren't. So and the wind was like coming from here and we weren't getting any airflow around the sail, we'd be having maybe a bit of a turbulent airflow like that. What would happen would be the outside one, the one we can see through the sail, would firstly it start flying upwards and then eventually it wouldn't be flying at all. So it would either just be sagging straight down or maybe going round and round, but certainly not um, flying straight back. So if that's the case, um, we either need to alter our course to get the wind. Yes. Yeah, so before you change the jib, check your course first, check your telltales to see that you are sailing on the right course. And then if you are sailing on the right course and the outside telltale isn't flying, it is as simple as if the outside one isn't flying, let the jib out. and. I think you're going to see where this is going for the inside one. It's the same kind of deal. The inside one isn't flying correctly. Pull the jib in. There we go. So if it's the outside, let it out. Inside, pull it in. And that is the nuts and bolts of how to set the jib on a downwind point of sail. I hope that helps. Uh, great to have you on board, by the way, James. I just saw you've tuned in just as we were coming to your question. Um, just going to take a short commercial break. And we're back. All right. So just checking in, checking in again with the live chat. All right. So, all right. Gaz Gaz says, I have a Hobie 15 and I live in Essex. Need a secondhand mainsail. What um, would you know where I should be looking? Yeah, it's tricky because 
there's not, I don't think there are so many Hobie 15s in the UK. Uh, my first port of call would be to get in touch with Steve or Hazel at the Hobie Cat Centre down in Paul. And um, if anybody knows about used Hobie kit in the UK, it'd be those guys. So uh, they're called, um, what are they called these days? I think they're called the Hobie Centre um, and they're down in Paul. So I would ask them. And then other than that, keep checking Facebook Marketplace, put in a search Hobie 15 sale. And then I think that is going to be the best that you can do if you want to get one from within Europe. But you could extend your search to um, on the main, mainland Europe. And um, in Holland, there are certainly some places where you might be able to find a main sale. Like at Hobie Cat Holland, uh, they've got so much uh, used uh, boats and kit there well worth a look or there's another place in holland called i believe it's bnr water sports which carry a massive stock of equipment secondhand for all types of catamaran that is what i would do if i was looking all right so um just scrolling through the live chat all right, so Matthew, who's just been measuring some measurements for us, um, any trick to removing a stuck rudder pin screw? Re this is in real time. He's changing his rudder cams as we speak. The screwdriver is destroying the plastic screw head. All right, so what I would look at doing, yeah, I see Dave 108. Hello, Dave 108. Dave 108 says, leave the screw alone and change the cam by compressing the spring. Now, this is a very good option if you're just about to go sailing and you just want to get a new cam in there, get back out. It does take a bit of grunt with your hand to get the tension off the spring enough to be able to knock the pin out. But basically take your hand, put it on top of the rudder stock push down with the um, with your hand on the cam, like Dave says, to take um, the tension off the pin. And then with, I'm sure you've seen the uh, service your rudders video with some sort of rod where I use a Phillips screwdriver with the tip cut off. With that special tool, push the old pin out, hold the cam in with your special tool and then slowly withdraw because if you if you haven't got your hand over the top when you withdraw it's going to be like an explosion because of the tension in the spring your cam will go flying chances are the plunger that follows the cam that will go flying the spring will go flying and that'll be it you won't be going out on the water today but if um and then if you are just trying to get back out on the water, what you can then do is using the opposite technique, get the new cam in position and then really push down with the palm of your hand on top there. Get your special stick into the hole to hold it in position and then tap the pin back in. That would be the quick and easy approach to getting that job done. But what it doesn't do is solve the problem for the future. You're still going to have a stuck screw in there. So the first thing that I would do is you've tried to loosen the screw with the cam in. So get back to the stage where you've taken the cam out. That's going to take a lot of pressure off the screw. So I would certainly do that first if the screw is really uh, jammed. Take the pre uh, get the cam out and then try um, undoing the screw. That's going to help a lot, not having the pressure on there. And I think I saw, yeah, Philip says heat it up and melt the plastic by pushing it in to get a better slot for the screwdriver. Yeah, so if you heat up the tip of the screwdriver 
with a blowtorch of some description and then get that into the slot of the screw, maybe tap it in with a hammer and then try to work that screw. That can sometimes free it up enough to be able to unscrew it. Um, I would certainly, if it's not on the boat, I would certainly have it in a vice um, upside down so you can get the maximum tension maximum pressure on the screwdriver if you've got a friend handy then what you could do one person pushing down on the screwdriver the other one a lot of screwdrivers you can put a spanner onto them to get more purchase so then one person with a spanner just gently pushing um but not to the point where the screwdriver jumps that would be the first point that i would go to before going to the next point, which is, as Dave has just said, to drill it out. And if you're going to drill it out, just check out, review the um, how to recondition your rudder stocks video. And it is all in there, uh, the procedure for drilling out those plastic screws. But if you've been quite happy with the tension in your cam and you're just trying to get out onto the water, go for option A leave the screw in the same place rather than dr drilling it out. If you haven't done it before, it can be quite a time consuming job. And if you're wanting to get out on the water, um, if you're wanting to get out on the water, then option A. Right, Matthew says, uh, casting is in the vice and the cam is removed. Hammer smacked into the nylon uh, screw for better grip. Go try a spanner next time. Wanted to re-grease it before, but may not be. A, yeah, um, yeah. Re-greasing the spring doesn't really help so much. You certainly want to have some spring on. Sorry, some grease on the plunger, uh, the piece that follows the cam. That really helps to reduce the wear and tear to the cam. Um, but it is, of course, nice to have those screws working. But if you haven't got any spare screws, that would also be a don't drill it out just yet. But certainly in the position where you are, Matthew, heat up your screwdriver if you've got the facility for doing so uh, with a blowtorch of some description, if you've got the facility for doing so, and then bang it in central into the screw. And then that will give you a bit more bite and again, if you can get someone else to help, that's really going to help. There we go. All right, we've got Yap on board. It's Yap from the Netherlands. That's Holland, by the way. He has a Dart 18. What do you think about Spinnaker on a Dart 18? Well, funny you should ask. I have sailed a, a Dart 18 with a Spinnaker once. And what I would say is when would be the right situation for using a spinnaker on a dart 18 i'd say if it's windy if it's trapezing conditions then i pop i probably wouldn't worry about it um it's you're already going to get some decent performance downwind unless you want to sail straight that if you've got an objective straight downwind which is a large distance and the water's fairly flat, then that would be a good time to put a spinnaker on the dart. But the time when I think it would be really valuable is if you're looking at doing some distance sailing um, and you want to increase your range, make your boat quicker, and for lighter winds especially, then that is when putting the spinnaker on the dart 18 or any boat which doesn't come with a spinnaker for that matter, that is when it's really going to make the big difference. Um, if you're racing, like whether it's handicap racing or fleet racing, you won't be allowed to fleet race with the spinnaker. And for handicap racing, I would say leave the don't have a spinnaker because when you race with a spinnaker on the boat, you get penalized in the handicap points. So um, I don't think it adds. Uh, enough to the performance.
to justify having it on there. But to get a bit more range downwind when it's not so windy, that would be the real bonus of having the spinnaker on a boat like a Dart 18. <clears throat> All right, Matthew says thanks to everybody for their advice um, with his sticky cam. Uh, time to grunt some more and then give up. Yeah, that is often the way. Uh, drilling it out isn't as bad as you may think, but unless you've got a spare screw to put in it afterwards and the right size tap to remake the thread, then don't start drilling it out because you won't be able to use your boat afterwards. All right, we've got Fred on board. He said, did I arrive in time for a sign-off again this week? Yet yeah, we are somewhere in, a, I'd say we're about two thirds of the way through the session. I've still got some preloaded questions, which I'm going to come on to now. All right, here we go. So keeping it in uh, Holland, we've got Kuhn, who has a NACRA into 20. And he says he is curious about uh, the theory of mast rotation. All right, so mast rotation, uh, this is going to require some sort of picture. Um, oh, here we go. All right, so this is um, the theory of mast rotation. So, on um, the bigger catamarans, um, we have adjustment on the mast rotation so we can get it in the right spot for what we want to do. Now, what we're generally looking to do with the mast rotation is we're trying to use the mast as an active part of the mainsail so that we get as much benefit from the mast as possible. Because on the catamaran, not only does the mast rotate, but it's also got a kind of a long, sort of narrower, more kind of wingy profile, which does, of course, vary from boat to boat, which means it has got a bit of an area to it. And we're trying to use that area to our maximum benefit. So if, if we look at the optimum, what uh, I won't draw this on the boat, we'll, we'll go a bit bigger. So what we want to do is have it so that the mast, this is for optimal performance, so that the mast is pointing directly in to the apparent wind. Um, like what we talked about with uh, the jib, uh, we want it to be pointing straight into the wind so that we then get that even flow of air around both sides of the mast because we're using the mast like a sail. And then with the sail, that wants to be coming off the mast like this so that the whole thing on the back side, the leeward side especially, is going to be very smooth and then the wind can just come round all that like that. If we had the mast in a different position, like this, then we're not going to get this even, this nice flow of air because it's going to separate here. Or if it comes in, then we'll have some turbulence here and we're going to lose some of the performance and the efficiency there. And then on this side, we're going to have a bit of separation there. So we're not going to get the same amount of um, efficiency out of the rig. Um, that's why we want to have the mast pointing into the wind generally. Um, now, what are the differences with this or, or how can we use this in a practical situation? Well, 
what this generally means is that when we're sailing, we want to have uh, the way we describe where the mast rotation is set is generally by where the mast spanner bar, that's the bar that is used to control the rotation of the mast, where that is pointing. And generally, most boats, most conditions, I would say having the mast pointing at the shroud is a very good place to have it. That works for most situations because as well as the mast uh, being pointing into the wind generally, on a boat like the Nacra into 20, we've got a spinnaker, which means when we're sailing downwind, the apparent wind isn't going to be straight across the boat. So this is for spinnaker boats. Instead, it's going to be back more, which means the mast is going to be that position for the mast is going to be correct most of the time. Um, in fact, yeah, for that sort of boat. Now, if we're sailing in lighter winds, what we can do when we hit the downwind point of sail. Winds coming from there so we can let the mast off. Because in lighter winds, we're not going to have as much induced wind going downwind. So the apparent wind is going to be more like this. So we'll let the mast off more. Um, really getting all the colours involved here. So that, again, we're getting that nice flow of air on both sides of the sail. So what have we said so far? Generally have it pointing at the shroud. On the downwind, if it's light, or um, have it all the way off. So we're getting, again, it's lined up with the apparent wind. And the other time when we might want to change it is if it's a strong wind and we're sailing upwind and you're sailing upwind, you've pulled the downhaul on really as hard as you physically can and you're still overpowered, then it's in that situation that on the upwind, we should then pull the mast rotation in. Now, because we've pulled the downhaul on really tight, it means the sail, the main sail, is now very flat. Um, in the strong winds, we're also, our apparent wind is going to be more from in front. So we're pulling the mast rotation in more so that it's pointing kind of at the corner of the back beam. And that is as much as we'd ever pull it on. So that would be um, the very brief guide to mast rotation, how much we should pull it on and when we would change it. So we're only pulling it on full once we've got the downhaul on as tight as it will go, when we're double trapezing and we still want to lose more power. By pulling it in like that, it's going to make the whole rig, because the main sail is flat, because we've got so much downhaul on, it's going to make the whole rig very flat. Because um, if we've got the mast rotated still, we're going to have that curve put into the sail there. It's going to make the, uh, the rig very flat and um, it's going to also allow the mast to bend off to leeward more, helping to spill some wind there. OK, so that is all I'm going to say for now about the mast rotation. All right. There's another part to Kuhn's question. And that is. Um, all right. In the NACRA Inter 20 uh, handbook. It says, with regards to the dagger boards, why do you have, why does it recommend having the dagger boards slightly lifted once it's windy enough to double trapeze? Right, upwind. Yeah, so you would think if you're sailing upwind, you'd want to have both dagger boards all the way down. But what happens is when the wind gets stronger, and there's enough pressure to
to double trapeze, you're going to be sailing faster, which means that um, it depends on the class of boat very much. But with the classes of boat, which have very high aspect, very long dagger boards, if we keep them all the way down, when we're going faster, we're actually, um, we don't need that much lift anymore. We can get the uh, desired amount of lift with less dagger board in the water. And if we have any more down, we're going to create more drag, which we don't want. And also, it's just going to, the only purpose it's going to serve is to make us fly the hole more. By lifting the dagger boards more, it allows the boat to run faster and that will generate even more lift as we go faster and it's not going to promote that hole flying as much. So there we go, Kuhn. I think that is what I would say on that topic at this time. Hope that helps. All right, so we've been going for one hour now. Could I um, say at this time, um, no further questions in the live chat, please, uh, because I've still got some preloaded questions. If you are here live or later on, in fact, if you could just take the time to hit the like button, that would be very nice of you. Um, and I'll continue. All right, so Fred says... Um, I think we're talk, still talking about drilling out the cams. Is it a good idea to start with a small drill and work up? No, um, I wouldn't. I When I'm drilling out a, a rudder, a, a Delrin screw, as uh, Hobie called them, for the cams, I just go straight in with the correct size drill bit. Unfortunately, I cut off the top of my head. I can't say what that size is, but it does need to be a long one to get in that far. I'll always drill in from the bottom as well, uh, where the slot is, but it could be helpful to find the middle of the screw if you did start with a small one. But personally, I've never tried it because to get a drill bit long enough to get that far in, uh, it's only the big one that seems to um, have that length to it. All right, Fred continues. One thing I never realized until owning a Hobie 16 for eight years is that the small spring clip that assists holding the mast foot in place whilst raising should be removed when sailing. It can catch the mast. Yeah, um, yeah. on a lot of boats which have some sort of clip or pin that goes through for putting the mast up, you should take them off for when you go sailing because um, not only can it catch while you're sailing, but if the um, the mast was to come down, uh, like if you had a broken piece of rigging, the mast came down and you had your mast foot bolted to the, the ball at the bottom, then if it's pinned in, it could actually rip the ball off, creating more damage. So I would always suggest taking whatever pin you've got at the bottom of the mast for putting it up, I would take that out uh, before you go sailing. All right, we've got Russell on board. Hi, Russell. Um, knocking off the dust this weekend for our opening regatta. Two days. Very nice. Uh, good luck to Russell. I think everybody joins me in uh, wishing you the best of luck, and I hope it goes well. All right, thanks very much to Mark for... Um, for chipping in with a very tasteful donation. If you'd like to donate as well, just uh, hit the super stickers button at the bottom. Thank you very much, Philip, um, as well. Wow, um, I'm very uh, touched by your generosity and I hope that means that you feel this information has been valuable. And uh, on that topic, I'm gonna go to our next preloaded question, which is from Gabriel. In Brazil, always nice to be hitting South America at some point. Um, he's got a Hobie 14 and the rudder is very heavy when I get a bit of speed up. I've checked the rudder is going down all the way. Um, 
I'm wondering, could this be the alignment of both rudders? Okay, Gabriel, what I would say is as well as checking, this deserves a picture, I think. As well as checking that the rudder goes down the right amount. So when you're putting your rudder down, you really want to make sure but where it goes into the rudder stock here, it goes down so that there is no gap there at all. So um, it is all the way into the rudder stock. Oh, and thanks very much to Fred for the super sticker. Um, very kind. And I am certainly going to be um, investing these super stickers wisely in the after show party after the live chat has finished. Thank you very much. Yeah, so make sure that your rudder goes into the rudder stock as much as it can. So if this is the rudder stock in all the way, and then it's not enough for that just to go in, it has to be held in to that position. So um, the first thing to check is when you actually put the tiller arm down, and it's locked, then check the rudder blade and make sure that it can't go backwards, that it stays in that position. Nine times out of 10, if you've got heavy steering, it will be because your rudder is able to go back when you start getting some speed up. Even if it only goes back so far that you can maybe put like a finger between the rudder stock and the blade, that is going to make your steering very heavy indeed. Now, the second thing, if you if that's right on both sides, it's also worth checking your rudder blades as well. If you've got um, rudder blades which are made from two halves, can we see this? Yes, we can. So if we look at the rudder blade from the front, like this, and it goes down further. You'll see down the middle of the rudder blade, this isn't for all rudder blades, but there are some rudder blades that are made from two halves. You'll see there's a joint where the two halves are stuck together. Um, if that joint looks like it's got a big crack running down it or something, that means that the two halves are no longer stuck together correctly which means when you get some speed up and um, that will increase the pressure, your rudder blade is going to bend a lot, um, which is actually a precursor to it snapping. Uh, but if it's bending a lot, it's going to make your steering extremely heavy. And um, that could be the reason. So number one, check this. Number one, check that. Number three, then we'll check the alignment of the rudders. And um, where can I draw this? All right. So if this is the boat, put your boat on the trolley on the beach with the bows on the floor um, so that you can put the rudders all the way down locked uh, while you're on the beach. So there's. Hold on, we need, I don't even know if you'd be able to see different colour here, but there's one, there's the other one. And then what you want to do is just check the alignment of the rudders. So with a tape measure, you can measure the front edges. And I would, very important to measure them in the same place, up and down, front and back. So I would go, just to make it easy, about two fingers down from where the rudder stock is, take a measurement from there between and from there in between. And so like that. And what you're looking for is the measurement from this front one just to be slightly less, like about six millimetres is enough. That is enough, but it needs to be in. If they are out at all, 
this is going to make your steering feel horrible. But the reason this isn't number one to check is because that would feel pretty bad even if you weren't going so quickly. So it is, um, yeah, but six millimetres inwards at the front from the back, that would be optimal. So I would go for those checks and see how you go there, Gabriel. All right. So next preloaded que question. This comes from Mishi. Um, Mishi is planning on buying a used catamaran and he's got two options. All right. So you can say what you would do in the live chat or in the comments. Uh, option one is a very old tornado from 1976, still in good condition, or a much newer Hobie 16. Uh, I've got lots of experience monohull sailing, a little bit catamaran sailing, uh, but planning to do more catamaran sailing in the future. Do you think the tornado is a bit much um, for sailing just on the weekends? Or does it make more sense to buy the Hobie 16? Now, I would say you are going, my initial reaction, I dare say everybody knows where I'm going to go with this. I would go for the Hobie 16 because it is, because it's a lot smaller, a lot more manageable, less complicated. And if it's a newer boat as well, it's quite possibly, it, um, in better shape, you are going to find it much easier, more straightforward if your time is limited when you get out uh, to go sailing at the weekend, much quicker to get a Hobie 16 from your trailer to the water than it is with a tornado. The tornado is also much wider, uh, three meters wide, which means that um, you can't just tow it behind a car. Whereas with a Hobie 16, you can just tow it flat, assembled behind a car, which means all you need to do when you get to your venue is put the mast up, uh, put the sails up and you're off. Whereas with a Tornado, maybe you've got a trailer where which tilts the whole boat. But with a 1976 boat, unless somebody spent some money on a trailer afterwards, I'd be surprised. Um, so I would go for the 16 just for the lack of fuss with getting that uh, out on the water as much as you can. The other benefit with the Hobie is that it's much more manageable to single hand. And when we're talking about manageable, you can single hand a tornado. In fact, it's really nice in um, up to about 10 knots of wind. You can get out on the trapeze, very nice, very smooth, feels fantastic. But if you capsize, then that's it, game over. Even with a writing bag or pole or anything, that bad boy's not coming back up. And then when you get back to the beach, are you going to be able to pull the tornado out of the water on your Jack Jones? I don't think you are. But the Hobie 16, much easier. It's a much lighter boat. So there we go. That's what I think. I uh, hope that helps. Uh, lower maintenance also with the Hobie 16. I'm not saying right off the tornado is a choice, but the 16 is just going to give you more time with less fuss. All right, we've got Medusa, the second on board. Is sailing a cat the same as windsurfing and kite surfing? Um, it, this is a tricky question. There are similarities, of course, um, because of how we're using the wind. So it's actually a lot easier than either of those sports because what we're doing when we're going cat sailing is we're sitting on the boat. Uh, we don't have to steer by using either the pressure in our feet or mast foot pressure, we're steering the boat using uh, a rudder or a pair of rudders, which we use with uh, effectively a stick that we hold 
to push and pull the rudders. We changed the angle of attack of the sail uh, rather than with our hands. We're doing that using uh, a, a rope with a purchase system, which we call the main sheet. Uh, so it's actually much easier if you can also if you can already windsurf to actually transition to catamaran sailing is pretty easy because you've got already the knowledge of the wind and having that knowledge of where the wind's coming from all the time is a really good starting point. But what I'd say is when you're starting cat sailing, regardless of where you're coming from, whether it's kiting, uh, windsurfing, water skiing, dinghy sailing, um, or parachute jumping, always start off your cat sailing career if you're going out alone or with somebody else who's not experienced, always start off with light winds because the catamaran is a big piece of equipment. Um, and in the stronger winds, if you haven't had time to practice in the light winds, it can get out of hand quite quickly. So that is a big consideration. But it is essentially the same as um, all the other wind powered sports in how it works. There we go. All right. So that is all we have time for today. Uh, I hope everybody has got the answers they were looking for today. Uh, don't forget to hit the like button before you leave. Uh, thanks to everybody, to Mark, to Philip and to Fred for chipping in uh, with the super stickers. Um, hello to Aaron, who's uh, in the live chat. Um, other than that, I will hopefully I'll have a video for you on Sunday. Um, if I get time, there's a lot on at the moment. Thanks, Philip. And um, yeah, have a great weekend. Easter here in Greece. So there we go. Thank you. Goodbye.